Good morning, everyone. This is Rona Palmer from Fluke Excelix. And thanks for joining us today for this edition of our Best Practices webinar. And in our Best Practices webinar series, we focus not only on technology and software, but also on maintenance strategies and business processes. And we invite guest speakers from a variety of backgrounds to share their knowledge. And I'm really pleased to have with us today two of our own from the Fluke Reliability team who will be co-presenting. And that's Adam Kornack, who's the VP of Enterprise Solutions, and Brian Harrison, who's the industry lead for IIoT. And they're going to be presenting in tandem today's topic. What's next in the a look at the transformational impacts of artificial intelligence, industry 4.0, IIoT, and other technologies. So good morning, Adam and Brian, and welcome, and hey, thanks for joining us today, guys. And, you know, I'm wondering, while we, uh, we have a pretty large group and while people are logging in, I wonder if uh, you wouldn't mind taking a moment and Tell us, what, what is it you're hearing out there when you're talking with customers and um, attending industry events that prompted you to assemble information on this particular topic? And what, what need is it that's out there that you're hoping to address today? So Adam and Brian, can you uh, share a little insight? Sure, and good morning, Rona. So starting a little over 10 years ago, um, you know, they came out with this chart, this graph that showed where maintenance was evolving, specifically around reliability. At that point, ISO 55001 hadn't been finalized. It was still operating under the title of PAS 55 out of the UK. And there was all this conversation around how we get from corrective to preventative and then making that leap to predictive maintenance. And that conversation kind of spun its wheels. And then a couple of years ago, a shift happened where suddenly the major technology companies started coming out with slightly more tangible first iterations of how we were going to get to predictive, how industry 4.0 or this whole concept of an industry of things was going to become real. And what's interesting is that as we've seen that conversation evolve over the last couple of years, is there is an easy disposition for people to kind of get frozen you know and the, the fact is if you don't make a decision that's in itself is making a decision in terms of technology so with all these different organizations vying for attention and trying to roll out new systems new solutions to try to address this and help organizations take those next couple of steps we thought it might be helpful to kind of talk from a broader scale the types of technologies that are out there and really help explain what the business cases are in those what ROIs, what wins are available today in those technologies. And that way, some of our customers and some of the organizations that we work with in a strategic manner are able to prioritize how they may or may not want to pursue some of these technologies and possibly roll them out and maybe evaluate some that they didn't necessarily knew existed or fully understand what value they could provide. Excellent. Okay, well, thanks for for sharing that, Brian. So uh, before I turn things over to Brian and to Adam to uh, present uh, their slides, a few quick housekeeping items. We're recording today's session and we'll share a link to the recording with all of our uh, listeners today. But we, we have your phones on mute so we get a nice clean recording. But both Adam and Brian have agreed to stay until the top of the hour and um, answer any questions you have at the end of their presentation. But please feel free to type your question in to the questions feature at GoToWebinar at any point during the presentation, and we'll read them to Adam and Brian to answer at the conclusion. Um, we'll also be sharing a copy of the PDF, and if you'd like to receive a copy of the slides, there'll be a brief survey at the end of the presentation. Uh, where you can request a copy. All right, so I think that's it for the housekeeping, and Adam and Brian, over to you. Thanks, Rona. So this is Adam Kornack. Let me just quickly go through the agenda, and I'll introduce myself as well. Um, so what we're going to go through today, um, after we do some introductions, is uh, talk a little bit about the challenges in today's maintenance landscape. So I think it'll be a good framework for our discussion. 
a um, little bit of more about Fluke Digital Systems, what we do and what the evolution to revolution is um, as we kind of look at it. Um, Brian's going to go into artificial intelligence and intelligent automation, which I think is really one of the most exciting parts of this presentation, along with the uh, virtual reality versus augmented reality. And then it'll come back to me and I'll go through a little bit more about IIoT and uh, mobility futures. And uh, of course, towards the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So, um, and the next slide, just by way of, by way of uh, introduction, a um, little bit about myself. Uh, I've had a very fortunate career to be able to have many different experiences from information technology to consulting and business process re-engineering. And most of my career has been in the digital IT transformation space. Um, some recent experiences with IBM and running a professional services practice and uh, just having some of the most exciting projects I think I've ever done. And hopefully in this presentation, I'll have the opportunity, I think, to share some of those experiences. Um, I do at times get an opportunity to write as well. So um, I've got a few blogs out there. I've written some books in my some of my earlier parts of my career. Um, and hopefully some of the audience will get the opportunity to read those. So, uh, so that's me. I think Brian, just a quick introduction from Brian as well, and we'll get going. Oh, sure, so Brian Harrison, um, certified reliability leader um, with the past decade, a um, little bit over, uh, spent focused on EAM mobile and IoT product projects um, across North America and Europe, um, specializing in heavily regulated industries, uh, specifically around aviation, life sciences, nuclear, uh, as well as public sector. Uh, excited to uh, be with Fluke specifically around their IoT because of the strategic hold point that we have and the idea of keeping an eye to where technology is going, but in, being able to support that with our 75 years of experience in the industries and automation. So to start, we, uh, we did want to ask a poll question here. So to begin, what are you most likely to invest in over the next year when it comes to the technologies um, that are relatively new to the industries that we serve? So Rona, would you mind taking the poll? Sure. So um, to, get, to get things kicked off, uh, Brian and Adam are asking, which of these technologies are you most likely to invest in? And you can give multiple responses if there are more than one. And we'll just share these in aggregate, so no, no wrong answers here. But um, it will help us understand sort of where you are in your current thinking for our listeners today. All right, it looks like we have about two thirds of the votes in, so let's leave things. People are really thinking about this. Huh? So are you looking to invest in mobility, AI, or AR? All right, great. So let's go ahead and share the results. So it looks like 41% are likely to invest in mobility over the next year, 20% in AI, 84% in IoT or ICM, Integrated Condition Monitoring, and 4% in AR. All right, quite a, quite a wide variety there. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into this. So um, let's talk a little bit about today's, man what man uh, today's maintenance landscape looks like. Just kind of provide a a bit of the framework for this whole uh, this whole discussion. Um, a recent study showed that since 2011, roughly 10,000 Americans have been turning 65 every day, a number that'll continue to rise over the coming year. And I, and I think why that's really important to our industry is that the individuals with all the knowledge packed away in their heads are leaving, and the new generations are significantly challenged to catch up. Um, no, so maintenance teams are really having to do more with less, with more complex machines, new systems coming into play, with less funding and higher goals, which is a, a pretty big challenge. 
In one of the studies, um, a recent large auto manufacturer recently lost close to 15% of their plant workforce through a retiree program. You can imagine the challenge that creates of the existing workforce and the loss of knowledge gained over 30 to 40 years. Uh, these are the same technicians that turned wrenches, uh, learned through manuals and by trial and error, and it's very hard to replace those individuals. Next slide, next slide, please. So just kind of as a next slide, uh, continuing on with the study of maintenance team and having to do more with less, the study shows that the top issues maintenance teams are challenged with are a lack of resources and staff. Uh, a secondary challenge is a lack of understanding of new maintenance technologies with 38% of the team surveyed. So these are real challenges and maintenance teams are asking themselves some very important questions. Uh, how can you best leverage the experts that you have today while they're still around? So uh, referencing and thinking about that last slide of the aging workforce disappearing. Um, also, what are the right technologies to invest in that will benefit us from the long term? Um, and hopefully, I think throughout this presentation, we're, we're going to try to answer some of these questions for you. Um, should you be recruiting new staff? Uh, where do you get funding and support? And um, again, as we go through this discussion, I, I think we'll be able to answer some of these questions. Next slide, please. So challenges in today's landscape. That's kind of uh, the, sort of our next uh, section we want to talk about. If you could go to the next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit more about maintenance strategies and where we see industries today on the roadmap to the maintenance curve. Um, so to the upper left of the chart, which may be rather small on your screen, are the fairly common maintenance centric strategies that I expect most of you are, are probably familiar with. The one you may be most familiar with is a reactive approach to maintenance. Sometimes that's referred to as run to fail or reacting to an issue of, of fault or fault. As an example, uh, a machine does its job and when something goes wrong, such an oil leak or a power outage, we react to fix the issue or failure. Sometimes that can be expensive, but due to time constraints and resources, it's not uncommon. So it's still uh, surprisingly 80% of how maintenance operates today. Alongside that is preventive maintenance uh, strategy, which I think I'm, I'm guessing many are familiar with as well, which is aligned to a little more a scheduled process, cash issues before they occur, like changing the oil in a car, which is definitely a scheduled maintenance every 3,000 miles or, or, or similar. And also very common also has some challenges. Sometimes maintenance is done too early or too low maintenance is done. Uh, but the shift now is a little bit more to an asset-centric approach. It's becoming more prevalent where the focus becomes the asset health not just the maintenance process itself. It's far more data-driven approach where teams understand and evaluate the health of the critical assets using real-time sensor data as an example, such as IIoT sensors, leading to more predictive analytics and more intelligent insights to potential failures. Uh, a good example is using a wireless temperature sensor on a chiller to monitor real-time temperature data, and receive alerts if the temperature rises to a designated limit. Um, ultimately, these condition-based or asset-centric approaches lead to a better decision-making to repairing an asset either well before a fault occurs and similarly not having to perform scheduled work before it's needed. So here maintenance teams can improve their maintenance models through continuous learning and not simply do what always has been done in the past. Next slide, please. Um, I'm guessing this is fairly familiar to most people, but I'm just going to kind of brush on it. I think most of you are probably familiar with this, but um, as a refresher, hopefully most, none of us were around for industry 1.0 and 2.0 with the early steam power and the start of electricity and always, which, which kind of led to more uh, modern production lines. Industry 3.0 is where things started to get more interesting with the use of computers and more advanced digital technologies where the use of PLCs and SCADA systems really, really got started. And Industry 4.0 is really what we're, I think we're talking about today in most of this presentation, where uh, today's wireless sensors, mobility, artificial intelligence, which Brian will get to shortly, and cloud and cognitive te technologies take shape. So you may hear even part of 
uh, of this being smart factories, smart manufacturing, or lights out manufacturing uh, without any human intervention. And of course, the industrial internet of things. Next slide, please. So investing in your future, I think this is a really important slide. And you know, when we talk a lot about technologies, um, you know, agree achieving an appropriate ROI is absolutely essential when thinking about technology. Uh, investing now in technology to not only allow organizations to realize a return in the near term, but if done wisely, these same investments should realize gains for years to come. Uh, it's easy to go after that next shiny, shiny object because it's the next cool technology, but it's also hard to be that first mover when it comes to technology. Hopefully the examples that you'll see today um, are not just about the future, but uh, also about the here and now. Next slide. Um, in, this, in this last section, before I hand it over to Brian, um, some very, very exciting areas of technology I just want to touch on. It may seem obvious, but worth pointing out. It's really about three things that maintenance teams really need. Um, and one is assets. They, they really need to know what's going on. Data is often captured for only a few high value assets. It's sitting in systems that isn't integrated with any EAM or enterprise asset management system. <clears throat> Uh, or SCADA systems, as another example. So there's data everywhere, but without the data being used to help technicians make decisions, it's not terribly valuable. Um, second part, just around systems itself, uh, technicians need access to the bigger picture. Uh, in today's workplace, multiple disparate systems are prevalent and rarely talk to each other. And these same systems aren't connected to assets or are very customized, so it's very complex or expensive to integrate to get the information needed. And last, the text. So last, we, we touched on this topic earlier on skilled workers are becoming harder and harder to find and replace. These same workers are mobile for the majority of their day, but still lack true mobile technology to support their job. Uh, they're still using paper, uh, paper notepads instead of mobile devices for documenting workflows. Um, hopefully these next couple, couple of sections will give you all a better feel for how to better solve some of these challenges. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Brian to cover some of the artificial, and, artificial intelligence and intelligence automation. Very good. Thanks, Adam. So before we jump into that, uh, we do have our second uh, poll question for the day. So how likely is your company to seriously explore the opportunities with AI uh, over the next three to five years? Uh, Rona, would you mind launching the poll? Sure. So again, just to kind of see where you are um, regarding AI, how likely is your company to explore it in the next three to five years? All right. Looks like we have this is quicker to answer here. We've got three quarters of the votes in. Give it up a few more seconds. All right, let's go through and just see how you stack up against your peers here. 25% um, Brian are saying they are very likely. 20, another 25% say likely. 34% say possibly 16, not likely. So it looks like half or 50% are saying it's at least likely they'll be exploring it, and then a third are open to the possibility. All right. Well, that perfectly aligns with uh, all the studies that are out there, so good to know you guys are on par with your peers. So we'll go ahead and jump into artificial intelligence versus intelligent automation. Uh, so to begin, I think it's reasonable to assume everyone in attendance today has some familiarity with artificial intelligence. It's a term that was created for marketing purposes and it's thus generated an entire genre of books and bestsellers. It's caused industry prognosticators and thought leaders to go around touring conferences the globe wide in an effort to prepare everyone for what they think is going to come next. Fewer people are familiar with the term intelligent automation. In simplest terms, artificial intelligence or AI, it's all about making the robot more like the human, specifically when it comes to things like doing analysis and making decisions. It's all about getting more human qualities, more decision-making capabilities into the bots, if you will. 
Whereas intelligent automation is kind of the antithesis of that. It's more about taking the robot out of the human. Uh, if you go back to early work studies around things like a first class man when it came to smelting pig ore, you know, it's really that idea of scientific movement in the workplace and getting that out of people to one, make their jobs more enjoyable, but also make them a greater benefit to the organizations where they work. In other words, it's about taking repetitive process that to date is done, in some cases isn't done, and having the technology or the bots, if you will, do that heavy lifting. So while the result is that we gain in efficiencies, the driver here isn't just about cost cutting. In fact, when you look at most of the studies coming out around artificial intelligence and intelligent automation, the one major warning that is out there is don't prepare just to do reductions and gain efficiencies. You need to prepare to ramp up because these are actually gonna provide considerable vehicles for growth going forward. And that growth is gonna require more a larger workforce and a broader set of skills. So it's more about getting people to doing what they do good. So get your subject matter experts focused on the areas that they can drive the highest value, both to themselves, but also to the, to the organization. But, so we'll go into a few more examples about that in a few minutes. But let's step back for a second, because for years, AI has been a ship on the distant horizon. It's kind of like a research and development lighthouse that sounds great, but beyond winning things like Jeopardy and chess, it's been harder to identify where we bridge that gap from what the goals are to actually creating a map on how we get there. I will say today though, it is safe to acknowledge that we are at the tipping point of artificial intelligence. So real world benefits are impacting people outside of the workplace and engaging them in their daily lives. It's similar to when mobility turned a corner. I personally remember that I was sitting in an advisory council meeting on asset management when the speaker in the front of the room asked everyone to hold up how many fingers to represent the number of mobile devices they had on their person in that moment. It really was an aha moment for me because the room averaged two per person. You know, I'd never really thought about it, but at the time I was carrying three mobile devices myself. But that's when I realized mobility had already become a part of our lives, not because it helped me in work. It's not something I did just for career. It fundamentally changed how I interacted with the people around me and the world around me for greater cause. And it really dictated to me how I was consuming data and as a relation of that, what kind of data I was accessing. It met me where I was, and that's where it really became a little more tangible and easier to adapt from a work environment. So when we look at it, AI is really on a similar path. People are being more and more exposed to it outside of the work environment. So if we just look at an example, for instance, Netflix, in addition to making recommendations based on what your viewing history is, artificial intelligence is being leveraged to generate custom thumbnail images from literally thousands of frames and options for every single title that they have. And it's designed to present you with a unique view. So you versus your spouse are gonna see a very different presentation of the exact same product. And it's all tailored to make it more likely and more obtainable for you to sit down and actually ingest it. Less customized marketing efforts are also being proactively engaged. And it's something that, whether on your phone or through any other type of technology, such as computers or laptops, you're seeing on a regular basis these attempts to influence our decisions and to engage us where we're at. So this desensitization in AI is making us more op open culturally to exploring the possibilities where it matters more in our workplaces. Today on the work side, the biggest AI wins are in marketing and healthcare, but in most cases, these triumphs aren't exclusively dependent on AI. They're rather an example of a partnership between the technology and human expertise. A good example of this would be a recent study that included Harvard pathologists and a predictive AI solution. So AI did really well at 92%, but phys the physicians still outperformed it with 96% in terms of accuracy on the diagnosis. But when they combined the two, that success rate jumped up to 99.5% accuracy. And that's a fundamental difference. That's a real tangible benefit, particularly when we're talking about the patients in the study, because that means three out of every 100 patients were able to either avoid unnecessary treatment or select and focus on a more appropriate path, care, path to care. So even with compelling documented victories like these though for marketing and healthcare, when you start to consider other industries like process manufacturing or utilities, it's, not difficult to understand why 30% of executives today feel that the business cases for artificial intelligence just are lacking, because frankly they are. 
I mean, no one denies the potential value, but pursuing that, what is attainable today, it's kind of hard to nail down when we're talking about a relatively young type of technology. The other part of that is that artificial intelligence is cool, but the investment to get there is not cheap. Generally speaking, it's a pretty significant investment and it's fraught with risks that include dead ends, faulty formulas or algorithms, the challenges that arrive with big data or dirty data, as well as the costs that come with a finite amount of skill sets and data scientists available currently for the industries to hire. So, go back, apologize. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, there's basically four major pillars that we need to get there. And those primary pieces include a vision, are basically a goal because nobody's doing AI for fun. So what are we trying to achieve? Why do we wanna even go down this path to begin with? After that, we're also talking about data scientists and the skills that we need, as well as the formulas and algorithms that are actually gonna do the background work to help drive better decisions and predictive natures. But then beyond that is the foundational piece of this, which is data. So while a lot of attention is given to the roles of data scientists and the power of the algorithms that are developed, a lot of people tend to underestimate the demand for data. And to ignore that, it's basically like trying to go to college and get a degree without reading anything on the subject matter. So I've heard this described a lot of ways and the one that really resonated for me was when I heard it called curating a library due to the amount of data that has to be loaded, maintained, nurtured, and updated in an ongoing fashion. So for AI, the practice is not just a matter of gathering all this data, then throwing it over the wall, storing it on a server and forgetting about it, except for when you need to run a query or a report. It actually dictates a new role and responsibility within an organization, someone who's gonna own and really take care of this aspect of data and this information that's gonna help drive where we're going. So similar to the old saying that everyone's heard, garbage in, garbage out, it really is about caring for that data in a proactive and ongoing fashion. So as SOPs, OEM guidelines, best practices evolve, that has to be reflected in the data. Even with the best algorithms, AI is only gonna generate foundational information that's gonna help you to the degree of what the data is supporting. So we load our OEM manuals, we can capture SOPs and document all of, that, all of the actions we're doing from a work order standpoint. We can grab and import work histories, user logs, but when it comes to the actual asset data, there's still a gap there. Most of us, at least to some degree, have installed smart assets that as we speak right now, we're generating gigabytes of data. But many of us aren't turning around with that data and doing anything such as trending analysis or looking for those first signs of performance degradation. And those signs are what allow us to shift that PNF curve slightly more to the left. You know, are we relying upon cron tasks and OEM prescribed PMs that may not be necessary, but simply because the manual is telling us to do it regardless of timing or cost. So one application of intelligent automation is to take two disparate systems such as SCADA or PLC systems, as well as your EAM or your CMMS, and then creating a comprehensive asset management solution for the entire enterprise. Instead of requiring someone with the skills to understand what they're looking at in a PLC system and doing an diagnostic within that screen, then having to turn around, log into a different system, and then look for an appropriate response. You can avoid those limitations with IA and go directly into monitoring the same data for an unlimited amount of asset, assets in real time and doing it on a 24 seven basis. It's truly having an asset owner for every piece of equipment and one that never goes home. So this allows your subject matter experts, instead of having to monitor PLC, to focus on what they are good at. So that can be making sure that assets are being cared for, making sure that knowledge transfer is occurring, helping you with change management if you've got new initiatives going out or new hires. But in our experience working with the industries, there are several areas that ROIs have come from when it comes to intelligent automation. Now the big ones that pop up regardless of industry are the elimination of unnecessary PMs, which I think most people on the line will agree that that can be significant cost savings, as well as notification of asset events in under six seconds, which is a pretty powerful proposition when you consider a technician can be aware of either a fail or a near fail, or a near fail, near fail um, in less than six seconds in the field. That allows them to reserve parts, accept ownership of a work order, and really skip a number of steps that normally would slow down the process to remedying a break fix. And the last piece of that would be around the automation process for issue resolution, which we just talked about. 
So we're empowering our assets to clearly tell us what's needed in real time and through dashboards that are easy to understand and followed up with prescribed steps, processes, et cetera. IA is focused on realizing meaningful ROI from a reasonable investment. As opposed to extensive investments with long runways to develop and deploy, IA by nature is not about having to rework systems, re-engineer processes, or develop one-off customized solution. It's rapid deployments using largely out-of-the-box capabilities to bridge gaps, leapfrog steps, and streamline processes. In many cases, adding stops on decision trees that previously wouldn't be possible simply because the requirement for man hours. The last point, point that I'll make on IA is that it has the ability to deliver both near-term and long-term benefits. It's something that Adam hinted on um, in the ROI slide in terms of the long-term benefits from a five to 10-year plan. Independent of where your organizations are starting from today or where they end up going tomorrow, you're able to get a significant benefit out of the data that's gathered now, and it can drive actions today that prevents a critical fail or expedites a resolution by automating past what would normally be the manual steps that are time consuming. But the second piece of that business case is that all of the data that you're gathering, the early detection, performance trending, PM, CM timing, it's all captured in such a way that they can be queried and analyzed in the future to help make better decisions. So if when our customers decide to employ some of the AI or MRO operations that are gonna drive better BI decisions, they're starting further down the path with years or at least months of accurate asset data mapped for the hierarchies that are gonna leverage your workflows, your unique nomenclature, all of those best practices that you've already deployed in your existing system. So as we continue to take these large steps in technology, it makes sense to wanna to leverage our data in new ways. And two of those ways that are being aggressively pursued are virtual reality and augmented reality. So just the quick and dirty summaries on these is virtual reality is a completely immersive environment where digital representations replace the real world. This quality can also mean that it's going to be pretty limited in terms of the world of maintenance, reliability, and operations. Virtual reality will never really be something that moves past the planning phase of projects or the training phase of technician engagement, simply because of the dangers that would exist. But augmented reality works as an enhancement over reality or what you're seeing in front of you. So overlaying additional context or readings that would otherwise either not exist in the field or most likely go unnoticed by the layman. So VR has been contributing to the bottom lines of early adopters for years and examples of the values include benchmarked and documented efficiencies gains that are, for instance, with the example of Thyssen and Krupp, they actually were able to do a reduction in the time to delivery for several, several of their lines of product by more than 65%. So that's a cost savings to them as well as an efficiency gain to delivery to market. But in other cases, VR has contributed to savings across the actual life cycle of assets. So the example that we'll give here today is Airbus, but you're also seeing this significantly in capital improvement projects at the plant level as people are starting to design and build new operations and that can include manufacturing as well as utilities. But for Airbus, for instance, what they're using is they're using a virtual reality designing tool when it comes to cabin layouts. And what they're doing is they're taking into account the likely ongoing maintenance events to ensure that the ideal assets are selected and installed, but that they're also done in such a way that future maintenance doesn't incur you know, wasteful pre-work or tear down thus causing more time on ground or lost revenue. This isn't unlike scenarios where that we've all seen. I mean, when I first started in the industry, one of the things that was jarring to me was walking into a beautifully laid out plant where engineers had spent months doing the design and the commissioning. And then when they turned it over to maintenance and operations, they hadn't taken into account how cumbersome it would be to reach some of the filters, some of the valves, basically standard PM and CM work that was gonna be engaged. And it was a matter of just lack of awareness of what the owners were gonna to need to do with the product going forward. So as I mentioned earlier, maintenance and operations simply cannot leverage VR in the field, specifically due to the safety and health uh, hazards. But how in the University of South Carolina, it's a really interesting thing I did wanna to touch on. The reliability program there at that college are exploring opportunities to tie VR into the real world and enhance other technologies and predictive maintenance. So what they've done specifically is through their partnership with US Army Aviation, in particular the Rotary Wing out of Fort Rucker, is they're using it 
their connection with that training epicenter for the US military. And they're incorporating some of those best practices, but they're also providing feedback on how to improve their own activities. So one of the adjunct professors at the university is actually a retired major general. And what they identified was that the most likely point for a critical fail on rotary aircraft is the gearbox. So USC disassembled, rebuilt an entire Apache helicopter in the classroom using it as a guinea pig to develop different aspects of AR and VR. And what started as a one-off iPad, <clears throat> iPad that allowed them to go up and using the microphone determine how far off a critical fail was from the gearbox, they've actually grown that so that they're triggering work orders off of infrared as well as off of the audio. But through that partnership, they've expanded to IBM, Siemens, and now they actually have a multi-year agreement with NATO. And USC is tying in other tools, including digital twins, machine learning, asset health indexes, and predictive maintenance. And that combination of tools is all helping them drive more accurate diagnosis and ideally the elimination of failures independent of the skill sets and expertise of the technicians that are actually receiving the error messages. So in, in other words, on the first day, Amanda can be just as effective as Emily, who has been working there for years. It just short cycles that learning curve for the technicians in the field. So augmented reality is a different beast when it comes to maintenance and operations. There's a multitude of, oppor of opportunities out there. An example of realized savings for AR is leak detection. Using, zero, using a zero training tool um, that's handheld and tangible, a brand new employee is able to locate and diagnose leaks in a fraction of the time without the need for subsequent tools, training, or even fundamental knowledge of the system they're inspecting. So in addition to that, they're able to capture the readings in real time, document them in the EAM system, where they can be shared with supervisors, other senior resources, or even be made available for future trend analysis. And through this augmented reality, the users presented an easy to navigate and easy to read set of data that's valuable and used to drive better decisions. So based on publicly available information around development efforts by various companies, we're, all trends are indicating that we're gonna see over the next 12 months, a significant launch of AR solutions, all driven by OEMs. So it's interesting to see that the trend for these go-to-market solutions and what it says about the acceptance of the technology, because up to now, the majority of AR maintenance solutions have been available through enhanced support and warranty agreements between customers and the manufacturer side, and it's really been limited to complex assets. So namely some of the rail OEMs, um, but also in broad range of the aviation manufacturers, including fixed and rotary aircraft, have really been focusing on this niche market for the last three years. Given the regulatory nature of those industries, being an early adopter to gain virtual, a virtual partner really makes a lot of sense in terms of validating the work that end users are doing. So this new wave of AR though is different because this new offering that's gonna be launching in the next year from a number of the OEMs is being developed through the lens of providing an operator focused companion. So the deployment of these new augmented reality remote expert guides are the reason for more than 40% of the cases where augmented reality is being adopted for industrial applications. So the KPIs being directly impacted by these services include OEE, first time fixed resolution, as well as emergency service calls and reducing those. So the success of these offerings is also changing the way we perceive these tools. Augmented reality is being seen as a chance for OEMs now to differentiate themselves from their competition where augmented reality remote assistance up to now really had just been focused as a new stream of revenue and a way to pull some of those strategic partnerships closer. It was really viewed as a nice to have for the end users as opposed to a competitive advantage. Now delivering this combination of technologies to the technician in the field is improving the quality of data, safety, and time spent from a break fix events. Which brings us to this question, what benefit of mobile IOT is most interesting to you? Rona, would you mind? Sure. Okay, our last poll question. Um, Brian is asking, what is the benefit of mobile IIoT that most interests you? Is it greater efficiency, cost and time savings, failure prediction, safety, or improved data in your CMMS EAM? <clears throat> and this one, they might all be of interest, but we're asking which one is of most interest to you. All right, it looks like we have 
three quarters of the boats in. Give people a few more seconds to weigh in. Okay, let's go ahead and share the results. So, Brian, 37%, or just over a third, say it's greater efficiencies, it's the savings. 51%, just over half, want failure prediction, if that's of most interest. 5% say it's most interesting for worker safety, and 7% for improved data. All right, so again, some clear, uh, some clear differences there. Very good, thank you, Rona. Okay, so uh, with this next piece, let's talk a little bit about mobility and the value proposition. If we can go to the next slide. Um, I think this next piece gives a good framework for not only the prevalence of mobility in our modern workplace, but also in our daily lives. It's probably no surprise that studies show that 79% and probably higher of homes have at least one connected device. Uh, my house may be a bad sample because I have at least 20 connected devices from nest, nest units to smartphones and fully connected homes. So um, I think you get the point. It's pretty hard to find consumers without some connected device today. And not surprisingly, these same types of connected devices are making it to the shop floor uh, and have been for years with IIoT, smartphones and tablets that are leading more efficient decision making and processes. Some of these benefits, also probably not too new, are increasing operational efficiencies, such as a connected sensor automatically pinpointing a failure and kicking off a service request. Worker safety is also a, a big important benefit, not considered as often, but if a uh, technician, as an example, knows a simple metric such as oil pressure that can be monitored remotely, they can be notified well before a potential disaster occurs. Uh, and last, location tracking, I think, is whether it be uh, on tools with sensors or worker location. Um, in one client example, workers spend over 40% of their time simply looking for the right tool, and sensors simplify that process significantly. Surprisingly, though, just 58% of the respondents in this study uh, were, were actually using mobile devices to access their, their EAM or CMMS system, condition-based monitoring system. Uh, let's go to the next slide for some other examples. So the evolution of mobility in IoT, let's just shift gears for a minute and talk about why we're even discussing mobility and IoT and maintenance. I think the biggest reason is that for most industries, assets and equipment have always been stationary. So technicians have always been mobile. Um, on a recent client visit, uh, we were asked to go on a tour of the plant to see how things were done. It turned out that the plant was five football fields long and the te technicians grabbed their pen and paper and took us on the tour. Three hours later, we were back to where we started to transcribe the work. Uh, it's, it's only now within the last 10, 10 years with the uh, advent of Wi-Fi, smartphones, tablets, that we have the technology capable to support this method of work. Uh, traditionally, technicians come into work, they grab their pencils, stack of paper, work orders, and they head out for the day. When they return, they either hand over their paper to someone to key in the information or wind up spending the last hour of their day keying the information on a system themselves. It's mind boggling to think that most organizations still operate this way. Next slide. Uh, this is a good example, I think, a very good pictorial example of a proactive PM before mobility was applied. Um, maybe this is something that looks familiar to many of the audience, but it's an example of, you know, a simple, you know, a technician replacing a bushing requires a work order to be sent via desktop. Once the work is completed, the work order is logged and on to the next step with greasing the ball joints and so on. In the third example, during a hydraulic replacement, the technician gets called away from the emergency and then further delaying the work order. Next slide, please. Now, after mobility, and this, again, may be something that, that people have seen quite a bit. It's, um, I've seen it in plants. It's not as prevalent, I think, as, as uh, you might think. But um, after the same scenario, except the technician now has a mobile device, such as a smartphone or a tablet, that already has the work orders assigned to them. So before they even go out without paper or pen, they actually get the work order directly onto their mobile device 
and they don't have to go back and forth for a desktop to dual entry with notepads. The system gets updated on site, logged immediately, reducing downtime, errors, uh, and, and just overall time of the work order process. Uh, it, while it may seem like a future scenario, many organs are, it's, as I said, are, are doing this today, and many of our clients are, are actively doing this. Next slide. So this is where we sort of shamelessly plug the Fluke ecosystem, but I think it's important. Um, everything you've heard so far is being used today with Fluke customers. The importance of ROI is very clear when our clients implement Fluke technology. This slide shows an example of cost savings by cutting travel and data entry by 88%. Um, and the examples in the prior slides are real life samples where mobile work order management, mobile SCADA, mobile inventory, and mobile calibrations are ideal use cases on the shop floor. Um, and another recorded scenario, preventive maintenance task went from 75 minutes to just nine minutes, um, all using uh, some of the Fluke ecosystem. Next slide, please. Um, these last couple of slides in these areas just want to highlight where Fluke is providing some of our customers with solutions and technologies you've probably seen today from connected sensors and data connectors with condition monitoring to full interconnectivity to mission critical systems such as PLCs and SCADA systems, all the way through predictive maintenance disciplines through operational history, mobile alarms, technician location, leading to what really is important in all of this is ROI for the business. So we're not just putting in technology for the sake of technology. Uh, I think many of, of uh, the audience here is probably a Fluke customer already. They've been using tools for years and years and years. And I think the big difference here now is being able to integrate all of that technology, connect it, get data, make decisions on data, and be able to um, predict failures versus just waiting for things to happen. Next slide. And just this last slide here is just um, one of the things that I think is um, one of, the, one of the newest offerings from Fluke was being offered a solution of being able to integrate uh, all of your Fluke tools with cloud-based solutions and integrate with uh, cognitive technologies like Watson IoT and IBM Maximo. So uh, something I think that very few, if any, of the providers today are able to offer. So um, we talked a lot about how difficult it can be to integrate into existing enterprise systems, um, such as an IBM Maximo, and how do you get the data off of sensors or the data off of PLCs? Uh, and we've got the ability to do all of that today. So um, that's that was uh, kind of our last slide there. And I, I think, um, Rona, I think we're uh, off to our last piece around uh, questions. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, gentlemen. And um, Brian, if you want to go ahead and advance the slides, um, we're going to open things up for Q and A. And by the way, um, we also both uh, Adam and Brian are going to be at the Accelerate Conference that'll be taking place next month in sunny Florida. And uh, if you want to see some of these technologies in action and meet with some of your peers and uh, get some training, that's going to be the place to do it. All right, so please go ahead and type any questions you might have, and uh, we, I'll read them to Adam and Brian. But guys, one question that came in during your presentation toward the beginning, and I know you touched on this, but maybe you can sort of recap for us. Um, a listener asked, with the rapid growth of data that's available, what are some of the impacts that you've seen on maintenance results? And you touched on a few throughout the presentation, but maybe you can each summarize what you've seen as some of the more compelling or impactful um, outcomes that happen when people really start to embrace uh, making data-centric decisions, data-driven. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can quickly uh, kind of provide my feedback on that one. I think one big one, and we've talked about this, is of course reducing downtime. So focusing on uh, things like asset health versus purely just scheduled maintenance and being able to do what you've always done, right? So uh, we've seen customers that 
uh, have implemented condition monitoring solutions or sensors. And it's not necessarily to uh, implement absolutely everything that we've talked about. I think our point was that uh, to start small and think about very important areas that could impact your business directly. So where do you get the most ROI? Where are the critical assets in your organization that you see time and time again are great opportunities for, for you to implement these kind of technologies and start small. Don't necessarily boil the ocean. So things like uh, again, reducing downtime or reducing a technician's time to service an asset because he's got five football fields to uh, to travel every day, um, reducing paper. Uh, and these things are, are things that have been used for years and years. It's not something necessarily that just came up, you know, yesterday, but it's something I think that customers sometimes are wary with all of the shiny objects that are out there that come out every single day. And just to touch on that, I mean, in terms of the benefits that we're seeing on the tangible side of what we do is, you know, things like rotating assets, assets that are critical to the mission of an organization, what we're seeing with more data becoming available and actually seeing it aggregated and leveraged for decisions is you're being able to identify bad actors. Um, you know, we're seeing organizations are able to go out in the field and say, okay, I've got five of these, but one of these I can now document isn't really performing. So on the private sector side, what we're seeing is organizations are able to quicker identify what is or is not operating to the level that is expected. And then they're able to remedy that either through uh, warranty claims or through replacements if it's close to end of life, but they're able to quicker do those calculations and determine if, is it worth continuing to do these PMs and CMs or is it something that we need to replace? So having that data available. Um, when you're talking public sector, what's nice is when you're getting this volume of data and you're actually leveraging it to drive decisions just from a customer facing standpoint utilities are better to are able to better articulate when they're talking about rate increases or they're wanting to show to the councils or the boards that they roll up to here is where our dollars are going they're really able to document that and get into the minutiae and thus when they're doing a business case and this obviously lends itself to the private sector as well it really helps the business cases write themselves so as maintenance and, op and reliability organizations are starting to say, we need to take this step, having more data, but more importantly, having the appropriate data and being able to present it in such a way that a layman is, is able to actually understand the messaging. It, it really does put you on better footing in terms of going for budget, in terms of communicating what the challenges are to people that aren't necessarily responsible for the ownership of the assets. Um, and, and the last piece on that would be the ROI that organizations are able to leverage from the ability of eliminating wasteful PMs or reassigning going from cron tasks to actually remedying issues or preventing fails. It tells a more comprehensive story. So even newer technicians are able to kind of understand that each asset does have a story. And when you see a critical fail, it's very rarely, you know, a lightning strike, something that came out of nowhere. Being able to have kind of a trail of breadcrumbs, if you will, over the life cycle, the asset, it helps contextualize you know, what our mission is, what we do in maintenance and operations. Obviously, there's some assets we're gonna run to fail, but strategically, more often than not, there's gonna be some that we wanna prevent fails. You know, We wanna get to that zero downtime nirvana and having more data that we're actually analyzing and using is taking us leaps and bounds closer to that reality. Okay, um, maybe you can also, um shed some insight on, you know, any time that there's a process change or a new technology being introduced, um, we see this over and over that, you know, there's sort of a, a cultural shift that has to happen and there's some resistance to change. And how have you, uh, maybe you can each share with our listeners how you've addressed that and you've seen people um, successfully navigate through that cultural change and adopt some of these newer technologies. And we'll sure. um, yeah, and you know, change management, when you're talking about certain aspects, um, such as mobility is a good example. You know, in more cases, you wanna find the resistors. You, you wanna engage people where they're at today. So you wanna find, you know, you, wa you wanna meet with 
the managers, the directors, you want to find out who they feel is going to be the one that is most likely to drag their feet on something or to say, you know, I've been doing it this way for the last 15, 20 years. I don't need to change. And that's who you want to meet with. They need to have a seat at the table and helping that dialogue start. You know, you, you genuinely can find a middle ground and you're able to move forward. When it comes to new types of technologies, it's slightly different because there's a proving ground there that the resistance may be a little more broader scale. It may not be one in 10, it may be nine in 10 that are saying, you know, I really don't understand why we're throwing money at a technology for this. And if this is anytime somebody hears artificial intelligence, I mean, there's probably 15, 20 books on the Amazon top seller list right now that is telling people your job's done. And that's simply not the case when you start talking to people that aren't trying to sell books, but people that are actually teaching classes and developing the technology. So part of it is engaging people where they're at, explaining that you know the goal of this isn't to cost jobs. The goal of this is to gain efficiencies and to help our organization grow at the enterprise scale. Um, but then when you're rolling out technologies, it's important to meet with different groups to you know break down the barriers and get silos talking to each other identify where we think a meaningful win will be you don't necessarily want to start in the hardest location but you don't want to start in the easiest either you want to set a realistic expectation for the organization so when you're you know scoping out and building fences around a pilot or a phase one of these projects to try to see if there's an roi to see if there's a reason to really go down this path wholeheartedly you're building it based on realistic expectations and your justifications are gonna be founded in something that is going to be representative of what the enterprise rollout would be. So you wanna take into account connectivity. You wanna take into account the people that own those assets. Is there some interest? They don't have to be flag waving, rah, 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 but you want, we want people that at least are willing to engage and are gonna provide honest and consistent feedback. Excellent. I agree. I agree, Brian. I have just one small piece to add. I think that's important too. And, and I've seen in, in change management programs, it's are really important is, is training, right? So I think we talked about this a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, I think it's important that everybody, number one, understands the value of the technology. It's not just, again, a shiny object or it's not, we're, we're putting this in because it looks cool. Um, I think it's about the actual business value that gets gained from leveraging one of these technologies. Um, and a training program is quite often forgotten because it's easy to just implement a technology. Uh, in today's world, everything's electronic. So here you go, go learn it. Um, but I think that's a big missing piece because, you know, when you get into the change management aspect of it, and uh, sometimes the resistance to uh, to use new systems, processes, technologies. A training program should not only train the user or the technician uh, on the technology itself, how to use it, but also the value that they're gaining from, uh, from using technology. It's not about eliminating roles or it's not about, well, um, look, you're getting a nice device, you should use it. It's really, why are you doing it? Why are you using it? How do you use it? And here's the benefit that you gain. Uh, and I think that usually helps quite a bit. We've seen some very successful training programs from, from clients that really take, uh, take that to the next level and have the opportunity then for, uh, for users to see that it really makes sense for them to, to use these technologies. Excellent. All right, we had someone ask, um, how do you know when you're ready to implement that? And maybe that will be our last question. Maybe we can also couple that with, how do you know you're ready and what do you do to get started? All right, if you're on this journey. Any final thoughts? Adam, when, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. I think. Um, yeah. I, I think one way you'll definitely know you're ready um, is number one by creating a business case, right? Um, again, it, it doesn't go back necessarily to the technology first as much as it goes to what's the business case around using the technology. Um, sometimes the business case is not going to make sense. It, you don't always necessarily go after 
using a particular technology just for using the technology. I think we've talked a lot about this. Um, so we've tried to encourage uh, clients we meet with or uh, when we go to events and, and we do speaking, we talk a lot about starting small, starting out with a business case that makes sense and show the, uh, show the return on that technology before you just decide to boil the ocean or, or deploy the technology broadly. You'll know through pilots, through proof of concepts, through uh, taking advantage of proving the business case out uh, that it's going to work. And again, if it doesn't work, it uh, doesn't mean you did something wrong. It just means that the area of focus is not necessarily the right place. And the, the one thing I would add is I don't think it's necessarily, I, I think it's kind of a subjective answer. I think if an organization's evaluating rolling out this technology, I think virtually any organization could do it successfully. I think the two big pieces of it are one, you need a technology that works. But the bigger part is you need to have a partnership. You need to be engaging with an organization that can help you be successful. You know, and, and it's not a one size fits all. As much as I would love to have our organization be the one that helps everybody, realistically, there's probably going to be situations where competitors of ours may be a better fit culturally with the organizations. And I think that that's a really important part because on this journey, I mean, we're not talking about a stagnant investment. We're not talking about a widget that we plug in and it's just going to work forever. So if people are looking at these solutions and they are considering taking this step, I think it's very important that they do take into account the culture of the organization they're engaging with and that both sides do view it truly as a partnership and that there is a genuine investment and a desire to help each other succeed. Exactly. And if you find that, I think that that will kind of help reveal itself that your organization is ready. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Adam and Brian, and thanks to all our listeners. And uh, we had more questions come in, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But we'll make sure that we um, get you answers after the session and uh, reply to all your questions. We'll also share a copy of the slides. And again, uh, don't let the dialogue stop here. Um, please continue the conversation. If you want to be in Florida next month, is a uh, we will have uh, you can see some of this actually in action. So thanks again to Adam and Brian, and thanks to our listeners. And please, there'll be a brief survey when I end the webinar. And please take a moment and tell us how did we do? What kind of topics can we bring to you that are really going to be help you move the needle in your organization. So thanks again to our listeners and to our presenters. On behalf of uh, Luke Excelix, we'll see you the next time. Thanks, guys.